Welcome back. Even if you're not back, you're welcome. Um, so please come in. Thanks so much. Um, I'm so glad that I pay my taxes on time because I helped to pay um, Bro Adams' salary, and he was so great at sort of being the rapporteur and telling us, sort of weaving together the threads of this morning. And based on the last two panels, we now have had articulated very well some of the values of a liberal, liberal arts education and some illustrations of how germane they are to all kinds of endeavors. And there's a commonality, you know, we making connections, habits of mind, uh, the level of thinking, you know, critical thinking, all of which, inspiration, creating knowledge, the ability to learn, very, very valuable in business, we've just been told. And uh, all of them, all of these values, all of these attributes are especially able to equip, uh, rather, should, are able to equip people especially um, with the ability to deal with the one thing we know is happening, which is change. Um, nowhere is that going on, uh, as we've heard already many, many times, than in the field of technology. So we're going to hear about imagining and inventing new technologies. And in the, um, in the spirit of inventing and, and imagining, we're going to actually change the format a little bit. Uh, we're going to hear from um, Jason. You know what, Jason? I apologize for not having gotten your, the pronunciation of your last name correctly. So tell me if I get this wrong. Jason Kozemchak. Kozemchak, thank you. Former technical lead for Twitter and software engineer Instacart, a graduate of Greenville College. Um, Eliz and the, the panel is going to be moderated by uh, Elizabeth Segrin, who's a reporter for Fast Company, but has been a journalist in many other guises as well. But first, we'll hear a presentation from one of our panelists, the entrepreneur and CEO of Ditto Lab, and the author of a great title, Enchanted Objects, Design, Human Desire, and the Internet of Things. He's a graduate of St. Olaf College in Minnesota. It's David Rose. Thanks. Well, I graduated from St. Olaf with physics and fine arts majors, and I also sang in the choir and uh, did, a voc did some vocal performance. And what do you do with a major like, with a set of majors like that, that are so dispersed? I thought maybe architecture was my future. Um, well, luckily, I, I, I chose to pick this, uh, the future of thinking about our, our interface with technology, you know, how that would change. And that's led to an entrepreneurial career across five companies. But I especially, just by way of introduction, wanted to show you what that looks like for my wife and family. <laughs> because my house is sort of my, an experimental lab. So the New York Times did a little um, a couple minute video piece uh, when my book came out last year. I just wanted to show you that as by way of introduction. same functionality that they had before, except now they can talk, they're connected. These are ordinary things that have extraordinary capabilities. When we're creating technology for the home, really we want to make something that's seamless and transparent. And that as opposed to having things sort of call out and draw your attention to it, make it a more ambient experience. We'll just continue to behave with those everyday objects as we on connectivity between two people. What we're seeing now is this proliferation of different devices that are you know, moving out from the cell phone and, and onto our bodies and into the world. So in the middle of our living room is a coffee table that uh, has Google Earth embedded in the coffee table. And I just found that having access to this amazing zoomable map completely changes how often we talk about travel how often we talk about the world and how often we look up places that are mentioned. And it's really, it's nice to have you know, this, this beautiful, large reference object, you know, sitting in the middle of our living space. Our devices can be a lot simpler and the interactions during it can be a lot simpler. Internet-connected umbrella 
can just be an umbrella that only shows whether it's going to rain. You don't need to tap an icon or do anything that seems sort of artificial. We come from a time in which we need to adapt to our homes and not be a platform. So what if our home could be a platform that we personalize and we customize? The key is how do we create this ecosystem, these technologies that allow us to move from one experience to the other in the more seamless, the more seamless, uh, most uh, magical way. Some people might think that a connected home is overwhelming, that there'll be so much information in the connected home that it's just a cacophonous environment and you wouldn't want to live there. But I think about how we decorate our homes today. We put photographs everywhere, we put paintings up, we put post-it notes up. You know, there's a lot of decoration and adornment in the home. And I think if enchanted objects can be designed in the right way, we're going to want hundreds of them around us. I think what we're going to see is a, a, a new renaissance where designers as well as computer scientists are going to really make a really big impact in the type of technology that we see in the home. The history of computers has mostly been about efficiency. I think one of the things that's changing is that enchanted objects can be about adding motion and adding magic to the fabric of our everyday lives and experiences. So you see I have a really fun job. <laughs> um, so I teach at this place uh, called the Media Lab at MIT, and it's one of these sort of anti-disciplinary places. You know, the students are brilliant, they stay up all night, um, but ultimately they make products and objects that they're passionate about, and usually it involves the coming together of, of some sort of psychology inspiration, a new technology, which is usually consumed computer science driven, industrial design, electrical engineering, uh, all of these disciplines sort of come together and mash up and then you get to create things like um, objects that help you, uh, this says omniscience. I made this poster that goes along with the book that basically takes, takes the human fundamental drive that we've all had forever that are being revealed through the fairy tales and myths and helps you uh, stay in tune with the stock market objects that we all have around us and embedding technology in order to help us figure out how to play guitar better or invent things with Legos or more. So let's let's transition to the panel, but I just wanted to show you a little bit of what I worked on. Hi everybody. Um, we realized that we're the last panel of the day, um, so we've, we've committed to keeping the energy levels high, uh, making this a very exciting panel for all of you. Um, I thought that I would start by, um, by talking about this narrative that's, that's been in the media about how um, the, liberal, the liberal arts and technology are somehow fundamentally opposed to one another. Um, we hear this all the time. Um, the venture capitalist Mark Andreessen once said that the average liberal arts uh, degree holder is fated to become a shoe salesman, hawking wares to former classmates who were lucky enough to have majored in something more practical like math. Um, PayPal co-founder Peter Thiel, um, who, who himself studied philosophy, um, refers to degrees like his as antiquated, debt-fueled luxury goods. Um, these are all people who are deeply immersed in the world of technology. And, um, and of course, um, there's President Obama's advice, um, which is that we should all for forego our, his our art history degrees for certificates in skilled manufacturing or some other trade. Um, so the fundamental argument here seems to be that um, the liberal arts degree with its uh, with its emphasis on a breadth of knowledge, um, won't prepare you for, for work that uh, requires you to have specific technical skills, um, whether that is uh, you know, coding 
or um, you know, business skills. Um, the liberal arts degree doesn't fundamentally prepare you for those things. Um, so I'm delighted to be here today with two people who are liberal arts college graduates um, who are also important members of the, the tech community. Um, and so uh, you've already sort of been introduced to them a little bit. Um, but I think that one really interesting connection between the work that they do is that um, they've both thought a lot about how technology um, can be and should be embedded into everyday life. So as David has just shown, um, you know, he spends a lot of time thinking about the internet of things and how technology can be deeply embedded um, in, in the very you know, sort of fabric of our, of our lives. Um, and Jason, for his part, you know, he's, been, he's, he's, he's worked at many different companies, but, um, but working at Twitter, he's thought a lot about how technology um, can be deeply integrated into the way that we interact with each other in a, in a social way. Um, so I thought a good place for us to start uh, would be to, to hear a little bit about what you both think about um, how technology fits into the human experience. And that's a very broad liberal artsy question for you. Um, but either one of you want to start? You want to start, Jason? Yeah, I'll start. Um, there's something about technology that seems sort of innately human, right? Um, there's actually, I think, technologies that um, we sort of take for granted and think of them as maybe sort of uh, assumed innateness, right? Like. A uh, written language might be an example. I'm not an anthropologist, but uh, it's a fairly new technology. You could think of it as a technology, right? And it's been so important to humans that we sort of just assume, right? It's just humans write things, and we communicate with one another. And so there's this interesting thing that can happen with really, really, with technologies that solve a, a global problem or a problem that's, uh, that many people face um, we pick those up and we distribute them and we, we sort of reuse them. Like the internet is a very new technology, right? It's only been around for a few decades. Um, so we're sort of in the infancy of what the internet can be and yet it's already provided a lot of valuable things, right? Like uh, Twitter allows me to connect with um, folks pretty much instantly all around the world uh, who maybe uh, I'm interested in what they have to say. Um, so I, I can sit here and we can talk and maybe 200 people can sort of, we can sort of interact with one another, but if I send a tweet out, um, I can now interact with, you know, my, you know, 2,000 followers, or if I'm Taylor Swift, I can act, interact with like millions of, of people. Um, so yeah, I think that like technology and it is, there's sort of like, it is a big part of, of being human, right? And I think it's very difficult to sort of see where that line delineates. Yeah, David? I guess I wouldn't, you know, technology seems like sort of, like a, a random hierarchical I, you know, uh, idea of, it's not really, it doesn't really organize anything to say technology. You know, it's not a discipline. It in, impacts every discipline, impacts how we, how we learn and how we work and how we, and how we live. Um, so, I mean, I, I think when I sort of think about all of the, you know, what we can paint pixels on or what we can, how we can embed uh, sensors and everything, to me, it seems like the best way to organize that is to think of tech more as a material. In the same way that like, when you're studying art, you study, there's color theory, you're using gauche, you're using wash, I mean, you're using, uh, you're using colored pencil, you're using oils, you're using watercolors, you know, and so I sort of see the, the, all of these new tech materials are you know, things that we can you know, embed in lots and lots of things. And then it becomes a question of, well, you know, what is the, what is the superpower? What's the aspiration? What do you, how do you want to change people's lives? Is the aspiration around wellness or well-being? Is it around keeping people informed? Is it about feeding people? Is it about, you know, and then you get to start to invent interesting things with that new material. Yeah, definitely. Um, those are both interesting ways to think about technology um, that don't often get discussed. Um, but you know, when we talk about people who uh, work in, in tech, um, you know, we often we often just say that you know he works in tech. But I'd really like to know what you do on a on an everyday basis. What is what does your day look like, and um, and how does your liberal arts education inform you know the nuts and bolts of what you do on a daily basis? Yeah. So as a, as primarily a software engineer, I spend my time reading a lot of code. Um, 
And so you, most people think that as like a fairly, uh, you know, it's, it's technical in nature. Um, and yet, uh, coding in software is very much about communication. Um, you're, as an engineer, you, you, you're writing uh, a particular piece of code one time, and then it's pretty much being read by everyone after you. So, um, you know, one of the things I use every day is my ability to communicate, right? How do I communicate my idea very clearly so that the engineer who's coming, at, coming up after me to maybe add a new feature or, uh, you know, to support some existing functionality can understand what I was intending to do uh, with, with that bit of, uh, of software. So, like, that's one of the things that I, you know, I find I use all the time is, like, is, is that skill. Um, there is a certain amount of, you know, sort of perfunctory, um, pre, I guess, prerequisite uh, amount of technical knowledge that you need to be an engineer. Um, that being said, uh, you know, when I graduated in 2007, um, the technology that I work with, uh, the platform I work with on a daily basis, the iPhone, hadn't even come out yet. So um, there's also this sort of, uh, you know, continued learning and sort of like this ability to self-educate, which I use and I continue to use as new technologies come out. I don't know exactly what I do all day. <laughs> I think wear many hats. Yeah, yeah. It's I, I feel like when I'm doing the, my best is when I'm remixing. You know, when I'm taking a process idea like from design, like the idea of crits, and bringing that to my sales team and saying, let's use the same technique that you might have in an architecture studio where everyone puts their work up and talks about it and trying to do that with a sales team and say, what, what would the artifact be that we would put up? Is, like, is it a pipeline? Is it metrics about the pipeline? And then try to sort of import ideas from one discipline into another discipline. Mm -hmm. So, and, or if it's a business thing, like it's talking to um, Nike about a new business model saying like, what about a subscription to shoes? You know, what would that, you know, what, what would that look like? How could you import one business model into another field and what would the ramifications of that be? Or I was talking to a company that was doing an internet connected toothbrush this week and saying, like, what's your, are you gonna sell like the, the brawn motor parts? Is that your, uh, your business model? Or are you gonna sell bristles, like more razors and blades, sort of uh, sell the consumables? Or are you going to, you know, or you have some other idea? And he said, I'm gonna start a dental insurance company because dental insurance in this, in this, in this country, 120 million people don't have dental insurance, it's 50 bucks a, uh, a month. That's mo more expensive for most people, but if you have an internet-connected toothbrush, you understand people's brushing habits, and therefore you can offer $20 a month <laughs> dental insurance if they have the brush. So I thought, oh, that's really interesting. So you're, you sort of have an internet of things idea that's about risk reduction. That's a, a new business model. Yeah, so. that's very exciting. Um, well, so when you were, when you, both of you were in college, um, did you feel like you had to choose between liberal arts coursework and um, and and developing more technical skills? Was that was that some a choice that you had to sort of make, um, or or did you acquire these skills later on? I mean, when you when you when you spoke earlier about some of the perfunctory skills that you need as an engineer, um, was that something that you had to? Was there an opportunity cost to learning that in college, or did you? Uh, did you acquire those skills after after you left? So in, in my case, um, I took basically one course in uh, algorithms and data structures. And uh, so basically, no, I didn't take any uh, sort of, uh, you know, that being said, I am a, I was a, a physics and math major, so there is a little bit of overlap, I would say. Um, you know, it, for me, I always thought I wanted to be a, a musician, but sadly, uh, the music industry basically uh, imploded <laughs> around the time I was, uh, you know, becoming of age. So, um, so I didn't really did put a lot of thought. I actually didn't put a lot of thought into what I was going to do when I graduated. And um, the thing about uh, the, the tech industry as it exists today is that because it's changing so rapidly, there's always something that you have to learn. Um, and so that's sort of what attracted me um, was just that constant shift and the constant, like every single day, learning something new um, about the about the platforms you're working on, or even about the world and different business models. You know, so the thing about um, the thing about you know being a, a techie 
uh, as they would people would like to call us, is that um, at pretty much every industry now uh, has some sort of uh, you know uh, techno, techno, technological piece to it. Uh, maybe if you sell, you're a vacuum cleaner company, you probably still have a, a website, right, where um, you list your products out. Um, so, so in that way, it's it's one of these skills that you can apply to a ton of different industries and really get to learn a lot about the world and a lot about how uh, people uh, go through it. Yeah. And what about you, David? Well, I, I think there's some hazards in getting a liberal arts degree. I mean, I think I think it teaches like it, it teaches a fitness of oscillating between things, you know, going going from a physics class to a fine arts class where you're doing pottery to doing to going to a uh, to going to choir for an hour and a half every day to uh, you know to going and playing you know running cross country or working at the newspaper or you know it sort of te it teaches you that you can that you can be interested in a lot of things and be engaged with a lot of people and a lot of causes and maybe the confidence that you can make a difference in a lot of those places, which is a sort of a risk. I don't know if you experience this risk, but it just means, you know, it, it means that the rest of my life I'm sort of hyper empowered to think that I can do so many things and it's a, I don't know, it's a, it's a it comes at a cost. So, so did, do you think that that confidence has prompted you to, to learn about things that you you really had no reason to learn about or, or shouldn't have. Well, it just means that the, like now I, I sing in the Boston Symphony or with the Boston Symphony Orchestra. You know, I have I have uh, interest in nonprofit boards. I'm helping startups. I'm investing in other startups. I'm going out and raising money. Like I'm, like it's a mess, right? <laughs> like it's a, like this sort of teaches you this sort of schizophrenia, like to put it negatively, that that you that you can that you can have this um, skill or adeptness at oscillating between all of these roles in life. I mean, you could, you could argue like that's the good life, right? Oscillating between learning and teaching at the same time and in raising money and investing and mentoring and being a mentee. Like mm -hmm. maybe that sort of oscillation is the good life, yeah. but it's also Crazy. confusing. <laughs> yeah. so, so Maybe uh, I think some of the answers to that, you know, is uh, what I've seen is that these boot camp, right? These coder um, general assembly is one of them. Uh, mobile bankers. There's a number of these in the Bay Area. Um, so like they might say, hey, this is a great option. I can learn. Uh, I can learn a skill. That's almost it's almost like a vocational sort of situation where I'm I'm spending eight weeks or twelve weeks to learn a particular technology. I can go and get a job at at Google or Facebook. Um, the the problem I have with these places, or, or the worry, I guess, is that um, they are sort of training for a skill. And uh, it's, to me, very likely that that skill is not going to be relevant uh, probably in the short term, right? Like technology moves very quickly. Um, and things you learned even 10 years ago aren't valid, right? Like the way that um, uh, how, how servers are rolled out and how software runs uh, you know, in the cloud today. It's very different even from you know, 10 to 15 years ago when everything was, you had to buy your own servers and your software was hosted sort of on one machine. So, um, so I don't know, right? Like, there is a certain amount of malleability, I think, that, uh, that the liberal arts taught me, at least, um, that I don't know you get in some of these, you know, in Mark and, and Peter, right, who want you to sort of, like, hack your way to the top. Uh, but I don't know if you're gonna hack yourself to, like, basically a uh, sort of, like, a local minima, right? That's, that's my worry. Well, I mean, as short term as those, you know, as acquiring those skills are in, in a way, um, in, you know, for many undergraduates who are looking for jobs, they're still very important. You know, you need to have them on your resume for an employer to take you seriously. Um, and so I guess, you know, if we shift the conversation away from your individual careers and we think a little bit about uh, liberal arts education more broadly, um, my question would be, you know, in your opinion, you know, based on what you what you know about the the workplace, um, when do you think is the an, an appropriate time for a liberal arts student to try and acquire those skills? Do you think that it's the responsibility of the college to be be offering um, courses that that will allow the you know allow students to to put those things on their resume? Um, is that something that they should is should it be part of the core curriculum even? 
Um, or is that something that perhaps, you know, sh is, is best taught elsewhere, um, you know, after college and, you know, taking a course at a general assembly or something like that? Um, when do you think is the appropriate moment to be, uh, for a liberal arts student to be acquiring those skills? Should they need them? Yeah. Yeah, I don't think you should learn anything practical in college. <laughs> you know, I think, I mean, after learning physics, like, you could do a spreadsheet, you can do cash flow, you can do, you know, any sort of um, mechanism for, f for funding um, a startup. Like, it's really easy math if you've been a, <laughs> if you've taken, you know, differential equations, as I did twice. <laughs> so, so I just, I guess, I, I feel like, the practicum of going and getting a paid internship is awesome because then you can get a feeling of the texture of the place that you aspire to work, which is maybe more important than, and it will also give you a sense of what are the specific skills that you need to, you need to learn. And it will also give you the sort of brand imprimatur of being able to say like, oh, I've worked at MIT or at Ditto Labs or where, you know, wherever um, you've worked. So I do feel like mixing the, the practical in with the college education is appropriate, but I don't think you have to um, do like a course in finance as an undergrad. Mm -hmm. It seems like a waste of time. Do you agree? I think it depends on, I guess. Be an entrepreneur, right? Yeah, what course you wanna take. So it sounds like, it seems like David and I are, are more entrepreneurial in spirit, right? We both you know, have smaller companies. And I think you could, um, you know, someone graduating uh, who wants to maybe go deep on one subject, they can get a job at, uh, at a Google, or I mean, maybe go back farther, they could work at like IBM, right? Which is maybe like a first wave tech company. And then you have, um, you know, your Yahoo's and your Google's. And then you have today, right, which are uh, more sort of smaller startups where you're sort of wearing many hats, right? Like in my day, um, like my day to day, I'm sort of a product designer. So looking at, um, what is what is it that the, the the customer and the user is sort of struggling through when they use our product, or or even maybe more sort of stepping back, like what is the problem we're solving? Well, in Instacart, it's um, getting groceries, right? So I need to feed my family, and how do I do that efficiently, um, but also like give myself time back? And so a lot of time is thinking about what efficiency. Really, you're all about efficiency. It seems well, like food <laughs> is about so much more than efficiency. Food, food is, yeah. It can be yeah. magic. Well, I am. No. <laughs> But that's how my brain works, I guess. Um, no, but it is magical, right? And uh, you know, the time you spend at the grocery store, I don't know, I mean, for me, when I go to the grocery store in real life, um, you know, I've gotta go and find a spot uh, in San Francisco, which is very challenging. Um, so I'll you know, do some circles around the block, which is not fun. And then um, I'll go in the store, and, every, and it's probably after work, so everyone else is in there after work. And we're sort of like walking through the aisles trying to, find some item, we don't know where it's at, so we're kind of looking all around, everyone's bumping into each other. Um, you know, and so the experience isn't a great experience, but we do it because like, we need to eat, right? right? But right. maybe there's a better way that uh, doesn't take as much, you know, th that gives you more time back, right? You could have those two hours to go home and uh, visit with your family. Uh, or uh, maybe work on the next round of funding, or right, like, or you know, make some phone calls. To... The best place to meet people was the grocery store. <laughs> really? No, the park is a just... better. <laughs> Who here met their spouse at a grocery store? Yeah. <laughs> Nobody. Okay. Well, I had a friend in Berkeley um, who thought that he was single, and he thought that the best um, way to score a date on Valentine's Day was to hang out in the ice cream section of the grocery store. Um, he was a computer scientist as well, so he's gonna try and solve that problem. So, um, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah those, are, those are great um, perspectives. Um, but, but, you know, you, you know you're both, um, you, you've both had very interesting careers. Um, and I know that you're, you're also employers. You, you've also spent a lot of time um, hiring people. And I know that in both of your cases, just from the conversations we've had, you know, you, you've been very open to hiring people with liberal arts um, backgrounds um, be, because of your own. Um, but more broadly, as you survey your industry, um, do you think that the tech industry is getting it right in terms of hiring liberal arts graduates? Um, 
um, you know, in the, in the in the news media, we we still hear of tech firms that avoid hiring you know English or religious studies um, majors because they don't have the right um, they haven't taken the right courses. Um, so so do you think that the tech um, that the tech industry has it right, um, or do you think that you know as people who are advocating for the liberal arts, whether we should be making a stronger case to the tech industry that um, you know, that, that the skills that a liberal arts graduate receives in, in school are actually very transferable. Um. Usually I can't afford liberal arts graduates. <laughs> <laughs> but you can, you sort of see, you know them when you see them because they just, they seem to have a broad interest set and they have personality that, that a lot of the MIT students don't have. I mean, I'm sort of serious because I, right now I have a company that does image recognition and it's sort of an, this esoteric branch of computer science where they have had, they, they had to have taken, or many of them have PhDs in you know, finding stuff in images, being able to see like, oh, that dress is available from you know, Bloomingdale's or those glasses are available from Warby Parker or whatever the, you know, the sort of specificity of what you can do with computer vision is crazy now and that's the, that's the focus of the company. But it comes at this huge cost because a lot of those people are like just so painfully introverted that our company culture now is really is 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 ter is actually pretty terrible from the engineering perspective because we have you know ten of those people who just work at their five big monitors and um, and we've, I've got to hire some more liberal arts <laughs> just just to improve the the um, dynamics of exactly the yeah so so I think um, at least at Instacart. Uh, even if it's only out of necessity, right? Like we, uh, we're sort of uh, fighting for you know folks from some of the bigger players who can offer larger salaries and uh, and and better and better benefits and um, spa massages on campus. Um, so you know, amongst uh, you know my team, um, I know there's at least an uh, Asian studies uh, major, there's an anthropology major, a uh, history major. Um, somebody who studied Zen Buddhism, though not in college. Uh, so we have, I mean, it's a very diverse background, right? And, and maybe that's out of necessity, but again, uh, at, you know, at least in the current stage we're at, we need people that, that are sort of like able to do one thing and then maybe jump over to a new part of the stack and sort of own that for a while because um, our website keeps going down because uh, we haven't written very good database queries, which is a real thing. Um, that's happening. So, um, so at least you know. I, I think that as a whole, the industry has some work to do there. Like, uh, you know, at Twitter, uh, our interviews really consisted of sitting somebody down at a at a whiteboard, and then asking them to code some, um, you know, some uh, some algorithm they're probably never going to use. It's probably re-implementing some sorting algorithm or you know, mirroring a binary tree or something that they're probably never going to do in the day-to-day -day business. One of the things that we're doing at Instacart is um, we basically give candidates um, sort of like a take-home quiz. Um, and at least uh, on the consumer side, which I work on, the consumer product, which is the product that um, if you were to go to go um, buy groceries today on Instacart, it's the application you would use to do that, which is available here in DC, so I recommend trying it out. Uh, but anyway, um, we give them an exercise, which is um, implement um, you know, searching for products. And that's a real problem. That's one we actually have solved already. And so what we'll see is how do they, you know, how do they communicate? Is their code clean, right? Can they communicate with other engineers around them by writing good quality code? Um, what's their design sense? Do they understand how users interact you know, on the phone? And you can see, like, what kind of interfaces do they come up with? We don't give them a whole lot of, we give them a little bit of a railed experience, but really we sort of let them run wild. So it's sort of like seeing how creative they are. Um, so yeah, and so I think you're seeing more companies shift to this because, um, well, it kind of find out like re-implementing, um, mirroring a, a binary tree is not a very good indicator for success necessarily, so. <laughs> Awesome. It also, I, I think it anticipates a new way of hiring too, which is to, oh, is to do um, test drives, right? To like, because we with many people we say, like we'll do, especially with marketing and sales people, we'll say, you know, let's let's do a trial period and have you, you know, be here for two weeks or four weeks and decide if you like us and we like you, and um, increasingly that 
I think that that will sort of be the way that people hire. Um, I think we have time for, for several questions from the audience. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. This is great. And I, I, must, I have to inject a personal note. David, I'm so grateful to you for solving the conundrum of my whole life and career. Because for all these years, I thought it was undiagnosed ADD, but really it was a liberal arts education. That, 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 <laughs> thank you. I, I, I actually do, while you're thinking of your questions, I have one that I, that I think has, has not really been asked all day. And that is about the effect of one particular arts and science discipline on your chosen field in your career, and that is music. I mean, I, I've never heard you play, but you've sung with at least one like major, I mean, St. Olaf Choir is, we used to broadcast them on NPR. Um, and you were, what, how does, if you can pinpoint it, did, does music, what role did it play? How did it apply to what you're doing now? That's what I should have wrote the book on. <laughs> it applies to so many things. Like it applies to being able to. Um, it applies to my joke timing. It applies, right. you know, it applies. Which is it, great, it, by the way. It applies to, you know, being able to beat with, in in three and in two at the same time. No, yeah, I think it. Um, there's so many things that can be thought of as sort of phrases or improvisations or harmonizings. Um, uh, you know, it serves as like a metaphor for almost everything that I do. Uh, and uh, I, I mean, a super practical thing is there's this term in consulting called consulting craft. And it's sort of all of the stuff that isn't your, your domain knowledge. Like it's the ability to speak clearly or at a pace where other people can understand what you're saying. That comes directly from thinking about at what pace do you sing the German leader song, you know, or standing up in front of an audience with decent posture and not mumbling and not apologizing the first, the, with the, you know, is the first thing that you say, um, you know, introducing a piece before you sing it, um, breathing, you know, where you're looking in the room, like all of those, all, you know, facilitating a team, um, like all of that stuff is consulting craft and I think you learn that just naturally in a liberal arts environment and certainly in a musical environment. Well, we were talking earlier about how we need, a, we need to coin a phrase for liberal arts uh, institutions and students that's similar, where you could say, oh, I have this, this craft, right. and it, it makes me very malleable, and, and it's a very transferable skill across many different jobs. Music. I, just, I just like music. I like rock and roll. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I've ever. I, I guess I don't self-examine enough. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but no, I mean, like to me, the, the one thing I learned as, a, as sort of growing up as a musician and playing with from people that didn't know what they were doing, and including myself, uh, was um, being able to make mistakes. You know, there's sort of like this. Um, I don't know, you know, people in the uh, in the Bay Area, and pr probably everywhere, right, like to say, like, you don't be afraid to fail, right? But, like, when you're playing with, with people, you have to be okay with, like, making the wrong notes because that's a part of getting better. And, um, and like, when you want to create you just, something new, you you're going to... right back in, right? Yeah. Like you, don't, yeah. you don't let it stop the, the music. Yeah, yeah, you just keep going. And so um, I guess getting comfortable with making mistakes in front of people, um, you know, and getting in front of people and talking to them when, you know, you haven't really prepared a statement things like that, you know, like, um, yeah, those are all skills that I think I've learned from music. Thank you. Yeah. It's, I, when, when the, I remember because I was working in the New York theater when the phrase freedom to fail uh, really started getting a lot of currency and just everybody I knew were just like, <laughs> <laughs> join the theater, freedom to fail. Anyway, uh, questions? Right, right here, thanks. And then identify yourself, Jennifer, please. Hi, I'm, I'm Jennifer Ward. I'm the provost at Centenary College of Louisiana. Um, uh, I think the phrase that you said that we needed um, was given to us by David. I don't know if you intended to give it to us, but I think we're empowered oscillators. Um, I don't know how that will play in Peoria. <laughs> but, but I've been thinking a lot about that and what the red thread is through all of the comments that we've heard today. And they have to do with things like translation and remixing and oscillating. And so I wonder if, uh, if you could speak to the question of whether or not what we really do very, very well is equip students to know how to stand in the shifting sand, that we prepare them to be varsity level evolvers. And I mean evolution, adaptation in that sense. I mean, there's no doubt that um, 
people are borrowing things that work in other areas of life and putting them over there like, and using them in other places. Like computers, like the computer industry, like sort of had its inception from the the, the loom, right, in a programmable loom, and being able to apply that to sort of solving uh, generic analytical problems. So like that was, that's an example right there, right, of like taking a problem that was solved and for something completely differently and then applying it to, to a different uh, industry. So, um, so like we're definitely doing this over and over, like we're remixing. Um, I don't know, you know, as far as what the liberal, I mean, I, you know, I think that these larger research institutions where you can sort of dive very deep, um, they do train you for, I mean, I think you can be successful, obviously you can be successful coming out of those uh, types of organizations and the same for um, more vocational. Um, but yeah, we, the world does change, it changed very fast. It's changing faster and faster all the time. Um, thanks to us, I suppose. Um, but as an entrepreneur, yeah. I think, don't you, I think I really value that ability to morph and shift and, and, re, and remix. And I feel like that's, that's something that, uh, that I can do because of my background sort of uniquely well. Like you tell me about your grocery business, I'm like, oh, well that's interesting. Like how would Google Glass change grocery shopping? Like if people are really persnickety about their fruit, like would you have a surrogate shopper? Like, or maybe you would have a, like my hotel room has stuff that's already there that if I just, you know, pick up the chocolate, they bill me for it immediately because their sensors are cheap, right? So you put the, maybe that's the future of grocery shopping. Like they stock your, you stock everybody's home with things you haven't bought yet. Yeah, let's let's <laughs> right? do it. Like, like, and so you can, like, right? That. And then you, when you pull it off the shelf, like, boom, you're like, you're, you're billed for it. Like, yeah. maybe that's the future. And like, what about spontaneous purchases or meeting people at the grocery store? Like, what will become the new meeting people at the grocery store for Instacart if you don't have, I mean, it's sort of like, it's just fun to like, riff yeah. on what that will mean and what the ramifications of that will be and I think we can do that be because of where we come from. Yeah, and I think, I think it keeps things interesting, right? Like the fact that I'm not going to be doing the same thing. I don't know what I'm gonna be doing in five years. I really have no idea, but that's okay. Actually, I think that'll be a lot of fun to see what that looks like. Yeah. Um, and it's good that that's kind of how the world works. You know, I'm excited about that. Like it's very, the, the, the contrast is um, the night before I came here last night, I went out to dinner with the president of Samsung US, and he was like, what should our future of our, we're, we've, we've sold, people aren't buying TVs anymore, right? People are like watching movies on their laptops and on their screens, and, and I'm like, why are you so obsessed with vertical pixels? Like, there's all kinds of horizontal services, and, you know, and a, a, lot of, a lot of other ideas, too, about sort of the future of Samsung, but there's some cultures that are just executors, not inventors. Mm -hmm. And I think we can be uniquely good at invention. And I think that the next, uh, your, one of the best ideas that you've told me about is online dating for friends, just trying to find friends, you know? I thought that was a great idea. I think, I think that would be great. Yeah, we need to get somebody to build that. Yeah, we need to do, yeah. do that soon. OK, we have time for one more question. There's, I'm sorry, it's Connie Morello. Hi, I'm Hope Williams with North Carolina oh, Independent Colleges and Universities. And I think your segment today is an excellent capstone to our day of reflection about what a liberal arts education means and how it can be in action. I guess my question is less about when should we offer technology as a part of that, as much as just what you were talking about, you see something, in this case, the liberal arts education. So how do we take technology and enhance that without removing the human element but in the very ways that you're taking situations and things and looking at those uh, shopping, among other things, how do we look at liberal arts education and figure out ways that te technology can help it be even better and greater in ways that are built in, not so much taking courses of it, but making it a better, um, a better offering? It's my, what I perceive in your question is this question about is this attitude that people that are our age and older seem to have towards new technology sometimes, which is to um, deify, fetishize, think it's something special. And I think one of the, one of the things that's so uh, neat about a, a place like the Media Lab is it's just you have this bountiful, like there's no, tech, there's no scarcity to the tech. So you just walk around and they're like, 
sensors over here and batteries over here and a, screw, and a machine shop and 3D printers. Like, there's just, there's, there's, the material for inventing with tech is so plentiful that you just sort of, you, um, you see it and you start using it because it's an available material. So I think my, my answer to that question is, let's just treat it as a material, let's treat it as a, let's make it bountiful and let's give uh, people as much access to that, to that bountiful material as possible. Because it changes your behavior if, you, if, if there's a, if there, I'm trying to find a, a good metaphor for this, but um, you know, if, if you were to take a potting class and there wasn't a lot of clay around and you were just given like this one square foot of clay, you would, you would say, oh, I have to be very careful with it. And instead, if there was just a, a whole wall and it was all free, like you would just, you would experiment and prototype and, and riff and, and just use, and you'd just, you'd make a lot more and you'd make a lot more mistakes and you wouldn't think about it as a, as a, as a precious material. And I think we should, technology this, in the same way shouldn't be seen as precious or special, but make it bountiful in the context of, of school. Yeah, I think sort of maybe continuing that point is that um, you know sort of technology for technology's sake, which there's plenty of, right? Like how many um, photo sharing social network apps do we need? I don't, I don't know. Um, so there are sort of like there's no shortage of things we can do. I think it's more about deciding like what we want to do and where we want to invest our time, and that's actually sort of the hardest problem, right? Is like time management. Like there are you know. X number of hard problems that need someone to solve, and um, let's figure out what those are and work on those and see how we can apply technology to them. More so than just, well, let's, we have all these things, let's play with them and see what cool stuff we can come up with. And I'm gonna work on time management right now. <laughs> <laughs> I wanna thank our panelists, David Rose, Liz Segrin, and Jason Kaczynski. Thank you very much. <laughs>